there's a surprising amount of violence in both of today's readings. Although it's the kind of thing that we take more or less for granted in our culture and in our entertainment, it strikes a somewhat shocking note in the Bible. The parable in the Gospel speaks of the violent reaction of a king to the earlier violence and insults of people who have rejected his invitation to the wedding banquet of his son. The reading from Judges tells the story of Jephthah, at first rejected by his family and community as a son of a prostitute. He's then entreated to lead them in battle against a neighboring people, the Ammonites, who are threatening them. Jephthah agrees, but then makes a totally unnecessary and foolish vow that if God enables him to be victorious, he will offer in sacrifice who or whatever comes out of his house to meet him on his return. As many victims as there are in the battle in which Jephthah and his men engage, the text focuses on the tragic result of his vow. The one who comes to meet him is his daughter, his only child. Her greeting is full of joy and love. She's delighted at her father's success and at his return. Although Jephthah is devastated at the turn of events, he does not reconsider what he has done. For him, the situation seems a simple one. He has made a vow, and now nothing, not even the inhumane and immoral acts that he is about to perpetrate will persuade him to change it. There are echoes here of the story of the sacrifice of Isaac. In both cases, a father feels compelled to offer his only child in sacrifice to God. There the similarity ends. Abraham acted in response to a command of God. Once he showed his willingness to obey, God intervened and prevented the death of Isaac. Jephthah's act, on the other hand, is the result not of God's command, but of his own decision not trusting that God would be with him in the coming battle. He tried to force him, as it were, to give his army the victory. Although the violence in today's gospel only appears in a parable, a fiction, it is still violence, and it is used to illustrate something related to the kingdom of God, therefore to God and God's way of being and acting. The parable underlines the foolishness and ultimately the self-destructiveness of those who turn away from God and who refuse his invitation to live in his friendship. The banquet here as elsewhere in the Gospels is an image for the kingdom in its fulfillment and to some degree in its presence in the world. The second part of the parable suggests that in the end, everyone is invited to the banquet. The servants go out and gather the good and the bad alike. In the words of the second letter to Timothy, God wills the salvation of all people. The ending of the parable reminds us that in order to share in the banquet, we must fulfill certain conditions. As St. Augustine once put it, Although God made us without us, he does not save us without us. We must respond to his invitation and become people of faith and love, people who, in whatever our situation, heed the voice of conscience and do what is right and just and in accordance with God's will. It is to this truth that the image of the wedding robe points. The guest has no answer when asked how he got into the hall without the appropriate garment. His fate is quickly determined. He is to be cast out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. The last line of the reading sums up the key teaching of the parable. Many are called, it says, but few are chosen. 
Although God's call is universal, not all respond to it, or if they do, do not respond as they should. Their lives do not prepare or dispose them to participate in God's banquet. The story of Jephthah and his daughter cannot help but provoke a strong reaction in us. On the one level, we feel outrage at the fate of this girl, a fate which she accepts with grace and equanimity. She asks only for time to lament that she will never marry and have children of her own. Given the context of the violence of the period and of her father's foolishness, there is something breathtakingly innocent and trusting in her abandonment of her life to her father's vow. The liturgy, by using Psalm 40 as today's responsorial psalm, he invites us to relate the young woman and her response to her situation to the life and destiny of Jesus. The letter to the Hebrews places the same psalm on his lips as he enters the world. Here I am, Lord, he says, I come to do your will. Not the actions of Jephthah, but the attitude of his daughter points forward to the self-giving that constitutes the perfect sacrifice that is the life and death of Jesus. Let us now in faith and trust present before God our needs. For all of us that our sharing in this Eucharist will make us more appreciative of God's gifts and more responsive to his will, let us pray to the Lord. For the intentions of our donors and of those who have asked us to pray for them, let us pray to the Lord. For the Canadian soldiers who have died or been wounded in Afghanistan and for their families, let us pray to the Lord. For the elderly and the chronically ill and for those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. For our deceased relatives and friends and for those who have died this past night that they will be brought to eternal life in God, let us pray to the Lord. Gracious God, we ask you to hear and grant these prayers as well as the more personal ones that each one of us has in his or her own heart. All this we pray through Christ our Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Wash me from my sins, cleanse me from my 